Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. What's your stage right now? What's the season that you're in? What's the lesson that you're supposed to be learning right now? Friend, you've got more laps to run. You're not nearly done with your assignment. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello friend, welcome to the broadcast today. Got something actually unique to bring to you. It was one of our Wednesday night services, a regular midweek sort of a Bible study service, but we also incorporated the graduation of our leadership college. Yes, Cottonwood Church does have a leadership college. And so we've got you know, a whole bunch of first year students that are just dressed regularly. And then our second year graduating students, they've got their robes on. And I was speaking mainly to them, but I was also speaking to the rest of the congregation about four keys to have a life of impact. And it's a, in some ways a bit of a different message, but I think you're going to enjoy it. I was doing my best to bring some practical leadership thoughts to these people that had given a couple of years of their life to go through our leadership college. And so just wanna invite you to join us, sit down, open your heart, and let's get into the word together. I have some thoughts to share with the students tonight, but if you've come, this is obviously a regular Wednesday night service here at Cottonwood. I have some thoughts, in fact, four thoughts, and I'm not going to be long, but but four thoughts that I believe can help you and anyone else in here move into a life of greater success, and I I almost don't want to use that word. I would rather say significance. And you know, the word significance comes from the word sign. A significant life is a life that is a sign that points others to God. It's a life that's lived for the glory of God, whether you're a banker, whether you're a a basketball coach, whether you're a computer programmer, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a student at this season in your life, whether you're a preacher, you know, whether you're a missionary, whatever, you know, you you do in your life, your life truly is only significant when it points the way to God. And God will use our lives for that purpose. And just, just four simple thoughts that can help you as you move into a life of greater significance. Number one, be faithful in small things. Be faithful in small things. In Matthew 25 and 21, Jesus said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Everyone say few. Few. Faithful over few, ruler over many. In Luke 16, 10, Jesus said, He who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Say least. In Luke 16, 12, he says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Say, another man's. And then in Luke 19 and 17, he says, because you're faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. So being faithful in the few, being faithful in the least, being faithful in the very little and being faithful in that which is another's are requirements before God brings promotion and release into that which is ours, our ministry, our calling. You know, there's a lot of people, they want to do great things that will rock society and change the world. And they got big dreams, and I'm all for that. But some of those same people that want to rock the world and do great things don't seem to be too excited about being faithful in the small things. They don't want to work in the small and the unnoticed and the unapplauded areas of life. But my friend, that's where God's eye is. 
He is observing our hearts as we perform in the arenas of the few and the little and the least and that which is another man's. I mean, just ask Joseph. He had to be faithful in the prison and faithful in Potiphar's house before he was promoted to the palace. He had to help Pharaoh with his dreams before his own dreams came to pass. And God is looking to see if you'll be faithful in another person's vision, in another person's dream, and helping them, and in a small arena. And it's not like, okay, i got to put you know, the, my, my time in during these seasons of drudgery. It's not that at all. We need to learn to enjoy the journey. Enjoy it when we're doing the small things and the unnoticed things because God is watching. And those small things and those least things and those unapplauded things are so important. It's in those arenas that our character is built. We're made into the men and women that God wants us to be and that God can use. I remember when I was an assistant pastor many years ago, one day the, the senior pastor had asked me and another guy to set up all the chairs. They were going to have a special event. And it wasn't a lot of chairs. I think that the auditorium maybe, maybe seated 170. And so we're setting up chairs, me and this other guy, and we're about a third of the way through, and this guy just threw up his hand and says, I'm not going to do this. And he began to talk about how he was called to greater things and talked about this prophetic anointing that he had, and he wasn't going to waste his time setting up chairs. And so he left in a huff, and I ended up setting up all the chairs by myself. You see, he wasn't willing to serve faithfully in that arena of the small and the unnoticed, but he did want to stand before a congregation and give out a word from God and be applauded. Friend, God, God is watching you. He's watching me in those small areas of our life. We may think they're insignificant, but they are not. They actually are very, very important. You know, it was October of 1979. I was living in a little one-bedroom apartment. I just had a mattress thrown on the floor in the bedroom, had no chest of drawers, had no dresser, just a mattress, and I think I had a little lamp on the floor. The living room, there was an old torn up couch in there. I had cinder blocks that I'd gotten with some old wood slats I'd laid across it. That was my living room table. There was a little table in the kitchen. It was barely being held together by screws and had some ancient piece of formica on the top of it. And, you know, I didn't have much at all. And one day I was in the bedroom, standing next to that mattress, worshiping God just talking to him. I remember I had my hands up. I was worshiping, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, you will minister the word on television. Listen, at that time, that was as far away as the moon. But I grabbed a little three-by-five card, and I wrote it down. There's actually a picture of it. I still have that little card. That's the note that I made on October 29th in 1979, that day, in my little bedroom. Do you know, years later, 1983, we began Cottonwood Church, and I went to a little local public access television studio where they taught high school students to use cameras on these, these you know, all this antiquated equipment. And I went in and, and learned to use the cameras, and we taped these boring attorney programs with a promise that I would be able to do one show. And so finally the day came and I brought my wife in and, and we sat down and talked about marriage. And then I, I asked the guys, I said, look, if there's ever any openings, we could do more of these. It won't be real religious. We'll just talk about marriage. And he said, well, sure, actually there is an opening. This guy dropped out that was going to do these things. So we began to do these little marriage shows. And we put them on public access at like 4 a.m., and we were so excited because we were on TV. <laughs> and then I started taking these, these big old tapes that we'd make to other cities that had public access stations that had slots, and they would put them on for free. We didn't have any money to pay for anything. And it came to the point that I was actually 
driving these tapes and taking them to 15 different cities here in Southern California, and they all put them on their local public access. So we're on in 15 cities for five years. Five years we did that, and I never got one phone call. I never got one letter in the mail. I never got a, a congratulatory card from anyone. I never had one person stop me in the market and say, hey, you're that guy on TV. <laughs> For five years, the only one that watched was God. And then some very large doors opened for us, and we have gone on, you know, secular television around the world. We're on in some hundred countries, and it's done in multiple languages right now. But, but you know, there was every opportunity to, to quit, but we were doing what we're doing for God, and we're still doing what we're doing for God. You know, there's a type, there's actually hundreds and hundreds of different types of bamboo, but there is one bamboo in China that is really unusual. They will tend it, and uh, it, it drinks water of the rain of heaven, and they will water it and, and take care of it for a year, and there's no noticeable gro growth in the first year. You can look it up in Wikipedia if you want to. Second year, no noticeable growth. Third year, no noticeable growth, but they tend it. They water it. You know, they, they make sure it has everything it needs. Fourth year, no noticeable growth. Fifth year, sometime during the fifth year, it grows between 60 and 90 feet in 30 days. Here's the question. Did it grow 90 feet in 30 days, or did it grow 90 feet in five years? All right now, some of you are tending bamboo. And whatever your bamboo is, you just need to keep watering it whether it's raising your kids, whether it's working at your job and being faithful, whether it's leading a small Bible study, giving on a limited income, be faithful. God is watching in the arenas of the least, the little, the few, and that which is another man's. All right, secondly, <laughs> number two, it's important to realize that life and ministry come in stages. Life and ministry come in stages. In Exodus 17, 1, Message Bible, it says, Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved on by stages from the wilderness. The Living Bible says God led Israel by easy stages. And there are valuable lessons to be learned in each stage. And until those lessons are learned, God never permits us to move on to the following stage. God does not allow us to skip over any stages. And the lesson for the, the stage you're in right now might be humility. Maybe it's a lesson of trust. When all of your under, underpinnings are taken out, all of your supports are gone, everything that you can lean upon is gone, and the only thing that you have left is the integrity of God's promise. And in this season, you're having to learn that His promise is enough. And until you learn that test, you don't go to the next season. Maybe, maybe it's a test uh, of stewardship and learning to manage the financial resources that God has given you, even if they're small at this time. That is an incredibly important stage. Maybe it's a stage where you're learning the lesson of forgiveness and walking in love when you've been persecuted or perhaps betrayed by someone close to you. Let's say you're going to choose a contractor to build your dream home. And so you've got different companies coming and bidding on the job, and there's this one well-known company, and you think, man, I've heard good things about them, and it turns out that it's actually the son of the owner of the company that is going to be the personal contractor over building your dream home. But you come to find out that he can't read blueprints. He skipped over that. His daddy just promoted him because he was his son. 
You find out that he doesn't know how to order the necessary materials. Sort of skipped over that part. You find out that he doesn't know how to lead a team or manage the work to be done in proper order. He sort of skipped that. He doesn't know how to use tools or run any power equipment. Sort of skipped that. He doesn't even know how to obtain building permits from the city. Just sort of skipped over that. Now, Daddy didn't do him any favors by promoting him, and you sure don't want him to build your dream home. Listen, our Heavenly Father is loving enough and wise enough to not promote us until we learn the lessons in each and every stage of life and ministry. You know, in John 17, 4, Jesus is praying and he says, Father, I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you've given me to do. Now, wait a minute. How could he have finished the work the Father gave him to do? He hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He's not talking about redemption. And if you read it in context, he's talking about the stage of life and ministry of training the disciples. He had finished that work. And then later on in John chapter 19 on the cross, he cries out, it is finished, talking about redemption because he's dying and doing all he can do for the rescue of mankind. But it came in stages. And if we had time, which we don't, I would take you from in, in chapter, Acts chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. You read about the ministry of the apostle Paul again and again. It said he finished the work the Lord gave him to do. He accomplished you know, his, his mission. He, he, he finished having done all. And I mean, just there's these, these words of almost finality. But you, when you read it in context, they're all stages. Because he hadn't finished it all. There's still more missionary journeys to go on. He still has to write the New Testament. And then later on in 2 Timothy, he says, hey, I fought, as writing as Paul the age, I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. But it came in stages. It came in stages. He finished one stage, God promoted him to the next stage. He finished that stage, God promoted him to the next stage. What's, what's your stage right now? What's the season that you're in? What's the lesson that you're supposed to be learning right now? Friend, you've got more laps to run. You're not nearly done with your assignment. And it is just so important to know that life and ministry it comes in stages. All right, number three, cultivate a thankful heart. You're listening to me, students. This is so important. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. First, we need to have a thankful heart to God for His goodness, for His salvation, and all of the rich benefits that accompany it. A thankful heart attracts more blessings, while an ungrateful heart repels God's blessings. Be grateful for what you have. Be grateful to God, but be grateful and thankful to people as well and for the things that they do. And, and don't just think it. Express it. Show it. Tell them. Sometimes I know we think, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful, but it doesn't do anyone any good except you if you don't tell them. We need to tell people thank you. And then one final thing is know who you are and know who you are not. Know who you are, but also know who you are not. Familiar story I read from John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. It says, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah had said. John didn't just knew, know who he was, he knew who he wasn't. Are you the Christ? No. Are you the prophet? No. Are you Elijah? No. Who are you? What do you say about yourself? That's a profound question. 
Who are you? What do you say about yourself? It is just as important to know who and what you're not as it is to know who and what you are. There's a, a gentleman that uh, I knew who he was and later on became acquainted with him, but he was a businessman that uh, I was in a meeting years ago. This is probably late 70s. And there was 2,000 people in the crowd, and, and he put out a challenge. He says, I will match anything you give in the offering up to a million dollars. He said, I'll match it dollar for dollar. He did it. I know another individual that, that has an international ministry, and the same guy has sown millions of dollars into his ministry. He's actually developed a, a large part of Southern Orange County. It's, it's you know, he's... And I know his story. He's a devoted, spirit-filled Christian. Started out with, I think, $500 and one cassette tape on how to discern the promptings of the Holy Spirit and how to listen to the voice of God. And he's, he, I heard him say that, that my whole fortune, everything I've done with my life, came from what I learned on that cassette tape all those years ago. I locked myself in a closet and I listened to it over and over and over and over. And finally, I got it. Now, he's actually come to Cottonwood several times never to hear me preach. But um, sometimes when we have guests in the church, he, he's turned up, and you'd never recognize him. You know, I mean, the kind of guy comes with jeans and a T-shirt on and a pair of penny loafers. And, uh, but but I, I, you know, got to know him, just got acquainted, and I, I contacted him one time. I said, look, will you please come and speak to our businessmen and businesswomen to just inspire them? And, you know, I appreciated his response. He got back and he says, Bayless, I'm really honored that you asked me, but I don't do that. He said, I'm not a speaker. It's not what I'm cut out to be. He said, I work behind the scenes. I influence people one-on-one. -on -one. He says, and, and God has graced me to make money and to give into the kingdom. But I am not called to be a speaker, so I'm going to pass. I, I was, you know, grateful with his honesty, but also the fact that he knew who he was and he knew who he wasn't as well. Now, John found out who he was. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, as Isaiah had said. He only knew by spending time with God and spending time in God's Word. And friend, there won't be any shortcuts for us either. We're going to have to spend time with God. So here, here's a couple of things you can do. Number one, want to find out who you are? Ask God. James 4 and 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. I dare you, ask God. Number two, ask yourself. Psalm 77 and verse 6 said, I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. And number three, ask others, people that you trust, people that are in your world. Sometimes we can have a big blind spot to something as essential as who we are and our own gifting where it's as, as plain as day to the people that are around us. You all know about this guy named Joseph in the New Testament. He had a significant role to play in the New Testament church, Joseph. Of course, we don't know him as Joseph because when the church observed, you know, the gifting that was on him, they changed his name. They said, you're not Joseph, you're Barnabas. Barnabas means son of consolation, son of encouragement. And that you read his life, that's what he did everywhere he went. He lifted up others, he encouraged others, he believed in others, he assisted others, and they recognized that in him and they changed his name. Now, if those in your world looking at you, what would they call you? Son of, fill in the blank. <laughs> A tree is known by its fruit. I was at my dad's house, actually today and yesterday, but I noticed yesterday as I walked up, they have a tree that grows out of this little thing in the front porch, and there's macadamia nut shells everywhere on the bricks there. Well, that tells me that is a macadamia nut tree. It also tells me they have a problem with squirrels. <laughs> but a macadamia nut tree produces macadamia nuts. Jesus said a tree is known by its fruit. Where are you fruitful? almost unconsciously and intuitively. Where do you produce fruit in your life? That, that intuitive thing that goes on with you, that almost unconscious thing, 
that you can make happen. It's good to ask yourself that. Where, where am I fruitful? Where, where, where do I, you know, fit in and, and produce fruit for the kingdom? So just to cover what we've talked about, number one, be faithful in small things. Number two, realize life and ministry come in stages. Have to complete a stage and learn the lesson before you move to the next one. Number three, cultivate a thankful heart. You'll be very surprised how far that will take you in life. Number four, know who you are and know who you're not. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that graduation service with our Leadership College Incorporated in one of our normal midweek Bible study services. We had a great time and uh, we're just so proud of all of our students, those that are in the school, those that have graduated. And uh, anyway, it was just a great night. And I'd like to encourage you uh, to do something. You may have heard about it. You may have not heard about it. We actually have a daily devotional that we would like to bring your way. If you just go on our website, you can sign up and then we'll send a daily devotional every morning We'll send a scripture to you and some reflections about that scripture. I believe it can sort of kickstart your day so that you, you can get into the Word and give you something to chew on throughout the day. It can enhance your own Bible study. So if you just go on to our website, you can sign up for the daily devotional. And again, we send a scripture and some thoughts about that every single day to you. And I want to close by just telling you thank you for joining us in the broadcast. Thank you to those of you who pray for us, for those of you who support us financially. We could not do what we do without you being on the team and being a part of what we do. So I just pray that God would bless you richly, that he would touch your family, that he would grant you the desires of your heart and bring you into broader, wider, greater things, give you great influence in the mighty name of Jesus. We will see you next time. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have besetting circumstances. The storms of life come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special bundle of, of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you hope. I hope that you get it. God wants to get your hopes up, way up, or maybe the hopes of a loved one. Along with two hope-inspiring CD messages, this bundle includes a booklet with Bayless' amazing story of how God completely turned his life around, setting him free from years of addiction and confusion. Call or order online now. Just use the information on your screen. And be encouraged, there is always hope. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.